My topic actually has changed a little bit. Um, the night before I left, or even the day I was leaving, I said, well, maybe I should do more of a comparison because it struck me um, that there's the American dream, which is quite well known. Now there's the Chinese dream. Um, and there's something of a competition going on, particularly for Chinese youth, uh, between what the American dream might offer and what the Chinese dream uh, might offer. But it's not going in the other direction. So why is the American dream more successful in a way here? Western culture is more successful here, yet in the other direction, uh, you don't necessarily see uh, Chinese culture being marketed very well in the US. So that's partly what I want to talk about, including talking about film. So I think I can use this uh, successfully. Um, a lot can be said. This is a kind of a complicated slide, but I'm, I'm using an article that appeared um, in a journal called Gai Gu Nei Tan, which was written by a Singapore academic, and not openly circulated, but um, a lot of people have read it, about the differences, seven differences between the Chinese dream and the American dream, including geographical differences, historical differences. But one thing that strikes me um, is the notion that the American dream focuses on individual wealth, China focuses on increasing the nation's prosperity and strength. That the American dream is a very powerful one because um, it, it stresses that if you work hard, you will be successful. Everybody has an equal opportunity. It doesn't matter what your social class is, where you were born. It's been a great attraction for immigrants, um, whereas China basically relies on the people already here. And as he summarizes in point seven, uh, China's dealt with a lot of pain and adversity since the Opium War, 1839 to 1842. Um, so the rise of China, the glory of the Minzu, or the glory of the nation, is particularly important. But the American dream is really about individual prosperity, success, rise in social status. So my own note to, to that survey is the China dream really relies on self-sacrifice. The American dream relies on just worrying about yourself. And that's why you can see why it's so powerful all over the world. Um, Tom Friedman um, talked about a comparison. In fact, he had some influence on even the concept of the China dream, according to Xinhua News Agency, that uh, they read Friedman's article, and that was suggested. So again, there's that American influence on the China dream. And of course, if you see the movie, Zhong Guo He Huo Ren, it's all about, in China, the dream of studying in the United States and passing SAT exams and so on. So there's an inti intimate connection uh, between the two dreams, it seems to me. If you look at some of the survey data um, on China youth attitudes toward Western cultural pen penetration, and again, this was an internally circulated survey, you see that um, these, these are tw 33 Chinese universities, uh, students of history, almost 73% were most concerned about individual success in China. Over 82 percent uh, acknowledge that Western visual culture products like Hollywood films uh, directly or indirectly propagate Western political concepts and lifestyles, but over 50 percent actually identified with them, according to the survey, and only 17 percent don't identify with them. Well, it's one reason why the survey could not be openly circulated, and, and the people doing the survey at the Academy of Social Sciences were quite shocked. And there were 21 questions, so I could go over the other questions as well, but they're quite shocked by some of the results. Uh, and again, if you look at some, again, some of the internal publications um, from CAS, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the assessment of the post-80s generation is that they kind of can't be trusted uh, for support. The bottom line is they're concerned with their own benefits, something we've heard about today. Doesn't matter what the political system is. If, if, you, if it benefits them, they'll gain their support. If it doesn't, they will oppose it. Uh, so you can see why there's a real concern and why Western culture is looked upon as one of the most dangerous threats to the Chinese Communist Party. I have a lot of slides on that, but I didn't put them on for this presentation. Um, now, if you look at surveys on actual values of Chinese youth, I uh, just put one up here. What is your belief system? Over 41% said no belief system. Um, and the people doing the research, and this, this was actually in, in the flagship journal of the Gong Qingtuan, the Chinese Communist Youth League. Um, they basically said, we have a belief system crisis in our society, which is why you need something like the China Dream, which came soon after, 
but how successful will that be uh, remains to be seen. This is an old survey from 2007 from Ling Dian uh, Diao Cha, uh, and it's only accelerated since then. So you see the age, the younger you are, the more likely you are to celebrate American holidays. Um, so the 18, 25 year olds, for example, much higher than people who are young. There's only one example of many I could give on that. The more recent uh, Pew survey from July 2014 showing generation gaps on views of the US in many countries. China was third, right behind Vietnam and Thailand, so that in terms of favorable, favorable views of the US, 60% of Chinese 18 to 29 had a favorable view of the US versus 39% of those over 50, so a plus 21 in terms of youngest, oldest gap. Second only to Vietnam, and of course there was that big war in Vietnam, which many remember, uh, and Thailand. Uh, you can go through many examples. At one point, Oh My Lady Gaga became the coolest expression in China, replacing Oh My God. Um, books on how to be cool, there are many of these kinds of things around, and you can see a lot resonates with Western culture. You look at box office data um, for films, this is from 2014, you see that Transformers, the fourth Transformers, with, had a lot of China content in there made over $300 million at the Chinese box office, more than it made in the United States. I put in red the Hollywood films, Interstellar, X-Men, Days of Future Past, Captain America, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Guardians of the Galaxy, Amazing Spider-Man 2, and so on. These are all very successful, and would be even more successful if there were not a quota system and there were not blackout dates for Hollywood films and so on and so forth. I'm gonna show you some data on Chinese films in the US in reverse, because you see how little they resonate. Uh, this is a survey I just picked up last week, actually. It just came out in 2014 um, from uh, the show by Kishrei Wenxian, Chu Ban Shu. I just picked this up and went through the survey very quickly before I left. One of the things that was striking to me, what is the most representative of the United States image? Hollywood, um, over 54%, about 55% said Hollywood. And you can choose more than one thing. Um, the White House, Wall Street, Statue of Liberty, U.S. dollar, Coca-Cola, uh, Pentagon, aircraft carriers, and so on. What struck me in, in reading this is if we did a similar survey, and I've looked for these in the United States, what do you think of when you think about China? I would think the Great Wall, uh, pandas might, might be in there, Confucius might be in there, all the things about ancient China or, or Chinese animals maybe like the panda, but none of these kind of brands like Coca-Cola or Hollywood. China lacks that kind of brand name recognition in terms of modern um, kinds of things. And of course, I can talk a, a lot about the TV series like Big Bang Theory and the popularity. Uh, I did an article uh, last year for World Politics Review, and one of the things I looked at was a survey in 2013 um, on what they call about 5,000 people in 62 cities. They were looking for something they ended up calling the generation of international floaters, Guo Ji Piao Yi Dai is what they call them. And this was mostly a post 80s, over 59% were post 80s, and close to 19% were post 90s. Uh, so close to 80% were, were younger people who had become these international floaters. Over 53% liked to watch English language films without Chinese subtitles. Um, they use VPNs for foreign websites. Um, Facebook, Twitter are very popular. They favor products like Starbucks, um, cars like Volkswagens, Audis, and Fords. So you see uh, some Chinese entrepreneurs recognizing this, building hotels like the Marvelot, using the same Chinese characters as the Marriott, uh, the Hyatt, but spelled with, with a little bit different spelling, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, same survey, over 67% prefer to watch English and American TV series, only 20.8% preferred Chinese domestic shows. Um, now many of those TV series were legally licensed, uh, shown on streaming sites, because that was less subject to censorship than regular TV. So in 2012, Sohu, uh, Tencent, uh, Youku, Tudo, all had over 100 American and British uh, TV shows. Um, that was a kind of loophole in the censorship system. Uh, so they allow Chinese viewers to watch shows with a kind of violence, scandal, and superstition. Other sensitive themes would not have been, which not, would not have been allowed or otherwise approved. That is now uh, being plugged. 
So if you look at um, this year, for example, these video sites, which had previously been left to police themselves, now have to submit episodes to census for approval only after the full seasons have aired. Uh, so if a season begins in September, uh, ending in May, it won't be legally available in China um, for internet users until June at the earliest. Now this has several possible consequences. One, certainly a setback for foreign media companies like 20th century 21st Century Fox, CBS, and so on, who have the licensing deals, but also, as some people have noted in, in, in the social media, uh, this may revive the piracy. All this pir the DVD stores that have been shut down with all these American TV shows, they may see a comeback. So you have policies, in the old Chinese expression, uh, you may have policies, but there are always countermeasures to any of those policies. Now, I didn't want to make it seem like only Western culture because you have Korean culture, this uh, uh, Lai Zi Xing Xing My Love from Another Star, very popular. Um, Where Are We Going, Dad? I Am a Singer, Superstar K, Hidden Singer, all big hits uh, after Chinese versions of the Korean shows. And this, the female star uh, of this Korean TV series, um, she likes Korean style fried chicken, served with beer, that beer, that became very popular in China. She gets about $500,000 for an appearance in China. So it's not just uh, Western culture, but, but Korean culture. And that is even more, seen as even more of a problem by China's officials because, um, as William Wan wrote in the Washington Post last year, um, why can't China make a soap opera as good as South Korea's? So one member of the Jiangxie, uh, said, it's more than just a Korean soap opera, it hurts our cultural dignity. But Wang Qishan uh, said, Korean drama is ahead of us. The core and soul of the Korean opera or soap opera is a distillation of traditional Chinese culture. They're propagating traditional Chinese culture in the form of a TV, TV drama. Uh, why can't we do it ourselves? And if you talk to people like Feng Xiaogang, the film director, uh, he says, my heart trembles when I'm waiting for a movie to go through the censorship process. So. Um, these are some problems that have to be faced, I guess. If you look at um, cultural industry market share, I'm doing a book now on soft power, Chinese soft power. Uh, US has 43%, uh, Europe 34%, Japan 10%, Australia 5%. China's right down very low in terms of the market share for culture on the international market. Um, and there are a lot of books like this, uh, Woman Meo Afanda, we don't have Avatar, uh, the crisis in Chinese soft power. If you look at some of the areas I work in, like um, overseas box office, you see Chinese film revenue is very low. Um, so it hit a peak in 2010 with about 3.5 billion yuan, and there are reasons why it was so high, mainly because they were counting really American movies that were co-productions. Uh, as part of this. Things like Karate Kid or Mummy 3 were considered Chinese films, which were not. They were not. So once they started cracking down on that, the numbers dropped by about two-thirds. If you look at foreign language films in the U.S., Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Wu Hu Tonglong, which is actually submitted by Taiwan, was by far the most successful foreign language film ever marketed in the U.S., more than twice as much as Life is Beautiful, the number two on the list. But if you also look at the list, uh, and I put the Chinese films in red, you see that the last Chinese film that did well, uh, Huo Yuanjia, Jet Li's film, 2006, nothing since 2006 has done well. Um, you look at recent Chinese films in North America, um, the only film that did even a little bit well, number 46 on the all-time list, was Yi Dai Zong Shi, the uh, Wang Jia Wei film, The Grandmaster, but Harvey Weinstein spent millions of dollars advertising that, full page ads in the New York Times, on TV and so on, still couldn't get much of a, uh, of a real market compared to others. So popular films, um, uh, uh, Xinhua, Lu Fang, uh, uh, Breakup Buddies, no market at all. Um, and other films like uh, Rang Zi Lan Fei, uh, uh, Tai Zhong, Xiao uh, Shi Dai, uh, all these films, this Journey to the West, Xiao, uh, Zhang Mo Pian, none of these films, or uh, the Zhao Wei film, Zhe uh, Qingchun, these have no market really uh, in the West. Um, 
I look at Zhang Yimou in a little more detail because he's probably the most well-known Chinese director, and he was successful back around 2004 to 2006 uh, with uh, Hero, House of Flying Daggers, Curse of the Golden Flower, uh, but his recent films, again, um, like uh, Jin Ling Shi San Chai, um, uh, the San Chang uh, Pian Jing Qi, none of these films have any real market. Now, here's going to be a change. I think the two areas where China can be successful, Zhang Yimou is now making an English language film called The Great Wall, uh, in English, $135 million budget, big Western star, supernatural elements, takes place hundreds of years ago. That's one area, making English language films. Secondly, animation, because you can dub those into, into English, I'm sorry, yeah, into English uh, or any other European language and be successful. But my question is, if Zhang Yimo is forced to make an English language film with Western stars, is that a victory for Chinese culture or a defeat that we can't succeed uh, with Chinese materials? Uh, you look at Academy Award nominations, uh, the last one of a Chinese film was Hero in 2002. Nothing has come close. So this year they kind of gave up and they nominated a film uh, directed co-production with a French uh, director, remake of his French film, The Nightingale, Ye Ying. Uh, I've seen the film, I was at the premiere with the director. Um, absolutely no market, uh, either in the US or, or I think even in China. Last thing I want to talk about is just some of the, even the really good films, like Di Ren Jie or Tong Tian Di Guo, Detective D. The New York Times gave it a great review. LA Times gave it a great review. Um, a masterpiece at Time Magazine. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon meets Sherlock Holmes. Only a lot more fun, said New York Magazine. Um, but if you look at what Tony Scott, A.O. Scott, said in the New York Times, if we lived in a utopian world, a borderless world without subtitles, the arrival of this film would be a global multiplex event, and the work of director Xu Ke, or Tsui Hark, would be at least as well known among American, speakers, American seekers of cinematic thrills as that of Jerry Bruckheimer, a famous producer, or Michael Bay, uh, who does things like Transformers films. But the fact is, it wasn't released very widely in the US because subtitles do matter. Uh, that's maybe 1% of the market. And if you do surveys in the US, would you go to see a subtitled film? They say, you know, I've, I finished doing my homework when I was in high school or university. I'm not gonna go to the movies to do homework. So it, it's, it's really tough. Okay, thank you very much.